So again, my name is Jacob Powell. I'm a general agricultural extension agent for Sherman and Wasco counties for Oregon State University Extension Service. And trying to do a webinar to go over grazing management this afternoon. My background is that I got a uh, master's in the science degree from University of Montana, where I'd worked with um, ranchers in the Northern Great Plains in Northeastern Montana, uh, working on prescribed fire and grazing management. So I do have some expertise in this area that hopefully can give folks a few different ideas on how to change things up on their operations that, that might be beneficial, hopefully. So rangelands are extremely diverse. And uh, even across the, this area here, you can see that there's a lot of differences in terms of productivity and nutrients that are available on the landscape. So th there are some boundaries with grazing and that with grazing management that uh, you can have an acre of rangeland and uh, no matter what you do that one acre, it's not gonna support a thousand cows. Um, but you could have a thousand acres and that's definitely gonna support more than one cow. And so it's kind of trying to find that balance. And this photo here shows that on the left, we have an area that's been pretty heavily uh, grazed, almost getting in a sacrifice type area that there's just not much vegetation that's growing left there uh, versus on the other side of the fence, obviously you could do some good amount of grazing on that and be sustainable. And so I had mentioned this earlier, but the quickest way to, to make a small fortune, you start with a big fortune and then you purchase some livestock and that definitely can, can be the case. And so what kind of the, the key uh, rules of thumbs that I think are important to take home is that basically with grazing management, it's all about the timing of when you're grazing an area, how long are the livestock in that pasture grazing? And then the frequency of the grazing being how often during that grazing year are the cattle coming back into that same pasture and regrazing it. And particularly with the timing uh, in our region, you wanna really be careful where you're putting animals in the, the early springtime. A lot of the cool season grasses that are key uh, perennial sources of forage in these pastures, if you're grazing them uh, when they're going to, to boot, it can be a very sensitive time that if you graze those hard enough, you're really gonna impact it further down the road versus if you graze those same grasses later in the summer after they've already um, headed out, you're not gonna hurt the plant as much. But it's also understandable that at that time, it's not gonna be as uh, palatable to some of your livestock if it's got seed heads on it. So it's kind of trying to find that right stage that you're letting it get to the boot stage, but you're grazing it before those uh, seed heads get extremely unpalatable for the livestock. And then we'll touch some on the duration. How long should those animals uh, be in that pasture? Uh, there's been a lot of, of research out there kind of battling and contesting the claims that continuous grazing is better than rotational grazing or vice versa. Uh, but I think there is evidence out there that if you're continuously grazing the pasture year after year, uh, it, th those plants in that area it needs a rest from grazing, uh, at least occasionally, even if you're not doing uh, you know, continuous grazing over five years in the same pasture, that's going to be a problem. But if it's continuous grazing for a year and then you move them somewhere else for a couple months, that type of continuous grazing it will not be as detrimental. So then I'm stressing this again that think about sustainability. If you continue to overgraze, you're going to break the bank. Uh, and there's been a lot of uh, folks out there stressing that uh, the cost of hay is a really easy way to get an operation in the bank. Some research has been out there saying that basically if your cost of hay is greater than 33% of the revenue you're generating from your calves, you might need to rethink your operation that if your, your haying cost is exceeding 33% of your uh, calf revenue, uh, there's a chance that that might not be an economically sustainable rate to continue. And I also want to encourage uh, small farm owners and large operations, um, think about putting your grazing management uh, as part of your story when you're marketing your, your animals to market that a lot of folks now, it's not necessarily that you're selling them a product, you're more selling them the story of your 
farming operation and knowing that, you know, they're buying something that's been sustainably grazed. And so don't be afraid to think about that with your grazing management and put some of those buzzwords in what you're marketing, because uh, that can definitely uh, pay down the road. This image here is even Burgerville is marketing that, you know, they're, they have sustainable beef that they're selling. Um, in this picture here, you can see this lady here is moving her poly wire or poly braid line out with the rotational paddock that they're using. And so that's kind of part of the, the um, sustainable story is that you can see, look at all the forage that those cows are in. Clearly they're doing a good job taking care of the land there and that's gonna help market their product. And I also encourage people, um, if you look up Greg Judy on YouTube, he's a uh, grass-fed uh, beef producer who's over in Missouri, and he's got a lot of stuff on YouTube about the benefits from rotational grazing that he's found in his system. But again, that is Missouri, so take everything there with a grain of salt that I think we've got uh, different timing of precipitation here in the dormant season and just less, less water coming out of the sky here that's will make some of the rotational things he is doing more difficult to do in this system for sure. And so I want to encourage people, when you think about intensive grazing management, that's not necessarily meaning that you're grazing the grass really intensively. It's more like your management is intensive, that you're out there constantly monitoring what's going on in the landscape. In some cases, you're being more intensive with the frequency that you're moving cattle from pasture to pasture. And that's a key distinction to make that we don't want to necessarily be intensively grazing, but we want to be intensively managing how we're grazing the landscape. And so this is a, a picture here of definitely out in kind of the, the native range that the grass here is looking kind of short in this pasture, but if they're rotating the cows to the next pasture soon after this, uh, they're grazing it for such a short duration that it's not gonna have a, a huge detrimental effect down the road. And so thinking about grazing management in our system, uh, there are some areas that have extremely low productivity in our region that we're still able to put some livestock on, but we have to be very careful with our grazing management that those systems continue, continue to sustain our grazing operation. So we have a lot of low productivity soils with a lot of rocks in areas. And we also need to consider, this is kind of hard to see, but you can see we have four bighorn sheep here that uh, livestock are not the only thing out there grazing. We've got uh, deer, elk, pronghorn, and uh, bighorn sheep in some areas. They're also taking some of that forage away from, from what your livestock will be able to utilize. So just make sure that you're taking that into consideration. And also I have this here to, for folks to think about how our system evolved with grazing in it and how Currently with our fences, we're definitely changing livestock distribution and grazing distribution on the landscape. So sometimes it's important to think about um, where we've came from in terms of how can we continue to mimic what a lot of the native range vegetation is used to, to being utilized. And clearly Native Americans had a large influence in the region before European settlers. And so this, this map here is just kind of showing the footprint of some of the different uh, Native American tribe, tribal boundaries. And so just they have historical documentation that the tribes here in Sherman and Wasco counties, they had tens of thousands of horses, just a, a, a huge number of horses that they were able to sustainably keep because they kept uh, moving them across the landscape. So a lot of like the blue bunch wheatgrass and native perennial grasses that we have they're used to being grazed, but they're used to having long periods to rest and recover from grazing before they're getting grazed again. And these native tribes, I mean, for they had basically a, a huge circle with you know a hundred mile radius that they would just continuously move the horses across the landscape. And so you can see just some of these huge areas that these different tribes had that they were able to move all these horses around. That's how they were able to sustainably have them. I also want to point out that grazing is a valuable tool that when done correctly can really help remove some of the flammable vegetation. It's mainly these annual forages such as cheatgrass, uh, ventinata, medusa head, some of these which are really hard to graze, but 
especially cheatgrass, if you graze it when it's going to boot in the springtime, you can really help uh, kick it back. Uh, kind of like I'm saying with the native perennial bunch grasses, we really don't want to graze some of those in the time that they're going to boot. But cheatgrass, it's a good period that's actually palatable to livestock and they're getting increased benefit out of that green protein that's actually in it for that limited window before it uh, becomes dormant. And so this photo here is basically, you can see on the left-hand side, it was grazed, but on the right-hand side, it was not. And so a lot of what was removed was primarily annual vegetation. So there I'm taking the red line off so you can, you can clearly see that fence line from a ways away. And so that's a good sign of, of good, good, a good use of grazing that it's removing those annual grasses. And so again, a lot of grazing management is trying to figure out where is this balance between removing something that's gonna be a fire hazard and uh, creating something that could potentially be unhealthy and detrimental down the, down the long road. So I'm trying to pop up in another poll here. If I can do this correctly. So I also want to bring up what's the difference between horses and other animals that are grazing out there on the landscape. So think about what other livestock animals are a horse's digestive system similar to, and then how do horses forage requirements compared to other animals that are out there grazing as well. And you can see this photo in the background. We've got two horses back there grazing. This is in the springtime. So you can see everything's still nice and green. Um, even at this last year, we still had some good green up that happened with some good timely precipitation that happened. However, we move on later in the summer, suddenly this is what it looks like. Uh, so obviously we're not having a fire hazard from the horses being back there, but I'd say this is grazed a little bit too heavily that there's not much residue left on the surface. So I'm going to go ahead and end the poll now that we posted. So the majority of you got correct that the horse's digestive system is most similar to pigs actually. And the next question here is that essentially horses require more forage than any other livestock that we really have in the area. And we'll discuss that more in a little bit that horses kind of require the, the greatest amount of forage than any, any other animals that we really have grazing out there on the landscape. So think about digestive tract capabilities. So you can see a cattle has a huge amount of uh, capacity inside of them. And so like 94 gallons and research has shown that uh, they have over 40 gallons of fluid that's containing all the microbes in their in the rumen that's helping break down all that forage that they're consuming. And so a horse and a pig, their digestive systems are different than ruminants. Again, ruminants being cattle, sheep, goats, alpacas, llamas. Um, so since they have a room in those microbes really help break down the forage that they're consuming and horses and pigs do not have that ability. And so they require higher quality forage because they don't have microbes helping to break all of it down like the ruminants do. So a key consideration with grazing management is to begin with, we need to make sure we're setting a sustainable stocking rate. And there's several different ways to go about that. The most commonly used one is just simply having an animal unit month determination. So an animal unit is basically how much forage a single thousand pound cow would be consuming. And then the animal unit month is what is that amount of forage required for that cow to be sustainable for one full month. So that's AUN. And so then other animals have different animal units, but those are compared to basically what a, a fully grown cows would be. And some of these AUM values, they were established looking at uh, the, the intake rates of, of beef cows on a, on, a, on a daily day. And so they determine, you know, okay, a thousand pound cow is consuming about, you know, 1.5% to 3.5% of body weight each day. 
but I also want to point out that, you know, that's a big range of percent of body weight that they're consuming, depending on the time of year. Um, are they going into gestation? Several sort of other factors that, you know, that's 1.5 to 3.5. That's still big enough of a range that that could really change what, what forage is being consumed on the landscape. And so different cows are going to have different requirements too. That's important to think about that this chart is showing that, you know, a thousand pound cow is equivalent to that one AUM. Um, they're consuming uh, 26 pounds of dry matter on a day. But if you've got a smaller calf that's weaned, they're not going to be consuming that full 26 pounds of, of dry matter intake. Similarly, a lot of folks these days, the common uh, cow size across the United States typically is looking at around 1,200 pound cow. And some livestock extension agents in the Midwest have kind of joked, you know, that you asked, a, they ask a producer, oh, how much weight does your cow weigh? And they say, oh, 1,000 pounds. And then they put it on the scale and it's actually, you know, uh, 1,250 or 1,300 pounds. And so obviously uh, they're consuming more than one AUM when you're looking at a cow that's bigger than that. Also, if you have a large bull, I mean, you're looking at almost doubling, um, doubling your AUMs depending on the size of the bull and what their needs are. So comparing cows to other livestock that are out there. So alpaca is not as well documented, but typically an alpaca has very similar forage needs as a sheep. And so they're saying, you know, 0 0.20. And also thinking about how wildlife compared to that as well. So basically, if you're trying to figure out what your needs are of your livestock, depending on what that animal is, you're going to time that AUMs by the number of animals and then by the number of months that you are going to need to feed them. So, I mean, if you're looking at a year of feed, then you just 12, multiply that by 12 months. So then the other question is, how do we determine how many AUMs are available on the landscape? And so one way to do that is NRCS has uh, soil maps in the online web soil survey. You can go in there and look at your soil type. And then from there, it will give you a ballpark of how much forage you can expect to be available. That's by far the, the most simplest way to do it. Um, or you can also go into the NRCS uh, eFOTOG, their electronic field office technical guide, and go through the, the various steps I've listed here and you can go to that link to access it. Um, but that method is basically basing it off of the ecological site description for the area. And so there's not as many of those for as many different areas. It's kind of more rougher estimated system. And we're primarily in the Columbia Plateau and Wasco and Sherman counties. And uh, a lot of the areas, very low product production in these dryland, rangeland environments. I mean, you're looking at values as low as 0 0.5 AUMs per acre per year. So basically meaning, you know, uh, you'd need two acres to support one cow for a year technically if you were not uh, supplementing them with hay or anything else in the winter time. So just walking us through, I would, be, would determine AUMs uh, using our soil map. And so basically the web soil surveyor, you select an area of interest. Uh, this image here is a kind of large area of property, but basically you go around your, your fence line, create an area of interest, and then the area of interest is going to tell you how much your plot, your pasture, excuse me, is made up of these different soil types. So then for each of those three different soil types there, we're going to then find the favorable, normal, and unfavorable grass production in pounds per acre that the soil that it's going to estimate from the soils that are there. And then you would repeat that for the other soils that are in, in there as well. And so again, real quick, if you type in web soil survey, this should come up right away. You have to actually click on this green button to start the web soil survey. That will then take you to a map that you will zoom in on and select your area of interest. And on Friday, the webinar I'm doing then, I'll try to cover that in more detail. Obviously, that's going to be recorded as well and posted um, so that, that folks, if you watch this and you want to figure out in more detail how to determine your forage availability, that's a way to do it. But anyways, you get in there, you get your area of interest that will generate a soil map. And 
if you look down here on the left, there's a column here on the left hand side, you scroll down there, you get to third one from the bottom, it says vegetative productivity. You're going to click on that on the arrow there to make that column open up. And then you'll see there's several different productivity indexes here. You're going to go to range per range production, favorable, normal, and then below that will be unfavorable. And so each of those, you'll click on that and then you'll click on view rating. And then it will make this table pop up. And this is the rating in pounds per acre per year that you want to be looking at. So here it's saying, you know, for that pasture, we have these different soil types. These are the ratings in uh, pounds per acre that they produce. And so again, this is showing how we're going to take those uh, production values, multiply that by the percentage of the area in your pasture that's comprised of that soil component. And then we get our total uh, pounds that are available. And so you, you add that up, but you have to remember, you know, you're looking at unfavorable, normal, and favorable year. That's a huge, uh, huge variability in the amount of forage that's, that could or could not be available. And so a good rule of thumb is to try to go with the amount that's going to be pr produced in normal year. Um, or if, you know, we're in a series of several drought years and you're recalculating your stocking rate, you probably want to use that unfavorable rate. So again, that uh, pound the 530 pounds of grass is per acre. So you multiply that by the total acreage of your pasture. And that gives you the pounds per, the, the pounds that are available in that pasture each year. And then to get the AUMs, you just simply divide that by a thousand pounds. So basically you have 371 tons of forage produced. In other words, 371 AUM. So great, we have this number of 371, but you have to remember that um, that would be assuming that our cows are going in there and eating everything off of there, which would not be a sustainable thing to do. You're going to hurt the landscape and you're not going to be able to graze in the next year for very long. So there's a couple of rules of thumb, but the, the most basic one is basically, you know, graze half, leave half philosophy. So then you have to divide that by two and you actually only have 185 AUMs available for that year. So 185 means, you know, you can run 185 head for one month or you can run less than 185 head for multiple months. And I just wanna reiterate as a minimum, you should be using a 25 grazing efficiency amount. So if you think, oh, I don't wanna, um, I don't wanna graze half leaf half, you're still gonna to need to at least take 25% off of that 371 AUMs because you have to remember if this is a native rangeland, you have livestock trampling it when they're out there. So they're not gonna eat that uh, vegetation that's been trampled and you also have utilization occurring by wildlife and other factors out there as well. And a key component of, of rangelands, um, especially here, also definitely in like the Great Plains type situation, you have high variability and precipitation that's occurring from um, year to year and within the year. And so this is showing, uh, Dustin Johnson is with OSU Extension Service over in Burns. He did this model that he looked back at uh, precipitation records in one area that went back to 1938. So if we were grazing 50% grazing utilization, that's what we're at. But these the red bars here are indicating the amount of forage that's being produced. And so we can see the actual forage availability to keep that at 50%, uh, only 34 out of 78 years did the um, amount of forage actually get above that 50% grazing utilization. And so this next slide will help clarify that a little bit. That the, the basically uh, this here is showing, so how much would you have to adjust your stocking rate depending on the amount of precipitation that happened in that year? And so, you know, we're trying to set a stocking rate that, you know, maybe we can just keep it at that level. But in reality, when the precipitation is varying so much, you kind of have to adjust your stocking rate to meet those demands. And so you can see here, you know, there are some years that basically you had to, to keep that, that forage at a constant level, you would have had to destock by 50%. And then you have other years in the next year, you could increase that stocking rate by 200%. And um, 
you know, you'd have to increase it all the way up to 200% to actually utilize all the vegetation that was growing because it was just such a productive year. And so it can be tricky when you're trying to find that conservative stocking rate, what's a good number that's going to actually work year to year. And so just reiterate that really you have to use constant monitoring to see what's going on on the landscape on your pastures every year to kind of help help guide you that, you know, it's good. Use that normal year productivity as a ballpark, but don't be afraid to change it. So when the grass does run out, you then have to calculate, well, how much forage are my animals going to need? And so if, if you've been running livestock for a while, you know what these numbers are and you have a good sense of that. Uh, but if you're getting new to the game, you have to understand, basically figure out what, how many animals can you support with the forage on the ground that you have with the AUMs? And then the rest of the year, you're going to have to come up with other methods of feeding them primarily with hay in our region. And so this is a tool to figure out how many tons of hay do you actually need. And so just walking through a quick example here that, you know, landowner, you have 10 acres, five of those acres you can graze that are pasture that you're grazing as forage. The other five acres are productive irrigated hay production. And overall, the land seems to be in good shape. And so again, if you have two horses, you're looking at 1.25 AUM, or they're consuming 0.5 tons per month of hay. So calculating what is actually available on the land. So you have those five acres, and you're assuming that it's in good production, you determine it supports two, two AUMs of forage produced. So you have 10 AUMs there. And then the pasture that they are producing with hay they have um, five acres producing two tons, so they have two, 10 tons of hay per year. So the critical component is calculating if is this enough for what the animals actually need. So the two ant horses multiply 1.25 times seven months that the landowner wants to graze them. You determine that that's 17.5 AUMs needed for those seven months. And then if he plans on feeding them for the other five months of the year, then he would need 10 tons to do that. So the question is, does this actually balance out? And if he is trying to keep the animals in there for seven months, you need 17.5 AUMs and the land's only producing 10. So that does not balance out. If he was just gonna feed hay for the other five months, you would balance out. But basically what this tells the landowner is, okay, I'm gonna have to increase my hay availability to sustain them for additional months because they clearly don't have enough forage to be there for the full seven months. Or does he have a neighbor that he can put, move the horses in a different pasture for part of that time? So I went over some ways that you can calculate forage production, but it is important that if you're really trying to set a better stocking rate, consider doing some sampling on the ground. And so there's different uh, hoop sizes you can use uh, I kind of like these uh, rulers that you can uh, fold up and unfold. And so basically you would put down a, a frame. You can also see a PVC frame here that basically you're sampling all the forage that the livestock, livestock would consume within that square. And then you can do different methods to determine the dry matter weight of that and then extrapolate from that how much production you actually have on the landscape. So it's, it, you can get a better number, but you have to remember, you have to do a lot of different plots to sample to really determine what your forage production is on the ground when you do it that way. So even when we're out there grazing, we need to constantly be monitoring what's going on in the landscape. Um, I'm personally not a fan of these grazing sticks that, you know, when the grass gets above this height, suddenly you can go back in and graze it. And if it gets below it, take the cows out. The problem with these sticks is you have to remember they work effectively if you're putting them in areas that are actually being grazed. But if you're just measuring the plants that they continuously avoid, that's not going to be a big, good uh, ballpark to determine that. And always take photos. Uh, if you're moving cows, I, I try to encourage people that when you move your cows to a different paddock, take a picture of what that pasture looks like when they're when they're leaving and what the new pasture looks like when they're going in, just to keep track of that over time to be really effective. Another way you can determine uh, grazing utilization. So here 
there were two T-posts with this um, metal cage wrapped around it. And so you can compare the grass that's in here that was not grazed with the grasses outside in the open range. But it is important, you can see here, the area right around this looks, um, basically has some bare ground in this area. And that's because of cattle rubbing up against this exclosure. So they were spending a lot of time rubbing on these T-posts and that's why the forage looks so bad right there. So you need to make sure that you walk, you know, 20 or 30 feet away from the exclosure and actually get a good representative, representative sample to determine the amount that's being utilized. And so basically then you would dry the grass that you collect inside and outside of the exclosure. And then you do a comparison between the two to determine the mouth words that they were removing when they were grazing in that pasture. Another key component of monitoring is um, look at what's on the ground. Uh, if you're seeing some of these weeds, that's not a good sign that we have. Um, Creeping Charlie is one that I've seen a lot of small acreage landowners that in areas that are overgrazed, the grass is doing terrible, but this is doing awesome because the livestock are not eating it. Uh, different thistles can move in. There's also a dove weed or turkey mule. In. I've seen that really increase in areas that have been overgrazed. And so if you have some of these plants that are increasing, it's a sign that you need to decrease your stocking rate or do something different. Again, determining on if your cows are getting enough uh, protein, their poop is a good thing to look at. So I, this kind of cracks me up, but there is an excuse me a cow poop analyzer app that is available for your phone that you take a picture of the cow pie and then it compares it to other ones in the system and can kind of roughly tell you what the crude, po crude protein is that they're consuming and the digestibility of it. But in general, you know, if you have a really tightly stacked cow pie, that's a sign that they're not getting enough protein potentially. And likewise, if you have a super runny one, that's not a good sign either. So you kind of want one that's kind of in between the two is a sign of, of a properly balanced cow diet. So another key component is setting a right stocking rate, but then thinking about where the livestock are distributing them, themselves. Because sometimes we have to readjust our stocking rate if they're only grazing the lowland spot and they're not they're not being active enough to go up on the steep slopes to utilize much of the forage there then suddenly we actually don't have that stocking rate is not available for the entire pasture. It's just for the area that they're actually utilizing. So keep that in mind. Um, this picture here cracks me up that somebody's got a shade shelter that they put out. And so obviously the livestock are attracted to the shade on the hot afternoon. And so I guess, I guess shade is one way you could try to redistribute animals in the areas that they aren't utilizing, but I hadn't really thought about that until I'd seen this picture. Um, Thinking about what our livestock need, water is an essential element and different studies have shown that, you know, if your cows are having to drink really brackish, nasty looking water, that's, that's not doing good things for them. Um, remember they have the, the 40 gallons of fluids that the microbes are in and if they're not getting enough water to those microbes, they're gonna have issues down the line. Uh, but, you know, in general, they're saying a, a beef cow or a horse, you're looking at 12 gallons a day. And so with distribution, where those watering sites are at is where the livestock are gonna be, be utilizing the forage a lot. Uh, often it's just that they tend to congregate around the water and so then they don't go as far away from the water. Um, that's something that if you really get into setting an effective stocking rate, there's different distances depending on slope and distance from water that are gonna determine, you know, how much they're using that utilization. Most people have shown that um, outside of 800 feet, the livestock are not gonna be using the forage nearly as heavily as they are in that area within 800 feet of water. Also wanna encourage people to think about when you're winter feeding, uh, these feeders are great on the right-hand side, but think about moving those to different areas in your pasture so that they're not just constantly congregating and abusing that same spot day after day for the whole winter. Um, so consider moving those or even better if you're using uh, round bales that you're unrolling, move where you unroll those bales each day. Don't keep putting them in the same spot. That's gonna be a really good way to um, redistribute nutrients across your field by uh, moving the cow pies into different areas as the cows are eating that. And then just the trampling in the litter that is being produced here, it's good to spread that out on your pasture in the winter time when you're winter feeding. <clears throat> 
Fire is another tool that can be used to, to redistribute livestock. I did a lot of work on this with my master's degree, but it's a tool that might not be as effective in our region, given growing conditions, uh, drought, and just uh, liability with issues we have with fire in the area. Um, but with my master's, so if you burned a patch, this is showing that one year, uh, this region here with the red polygon was burned. And then livestock came in after that recovered and grazed it. And so they, they tended to congregate more in the recently burned area. And in this case is more of an upland that caused them to get away from the, the um, creek down here at the bottom and help, help encourage them to utilize the uplands. And then over several years, the next year you burn a different spot, they're gonna suddenly reutilize this. They'll still come back and use this after one year since fire is what I found. And then over a three year period, you can burn basically a different section of your pasture each year. And so each year that's moving them to a different part of that pasture. So we might not do this with fire commonly in our region, but this is something to think about that if you have water sources you, you can move, or if you're using um, mineral supplementation, move where those supplements are at uh, during the grazing season, or just you know each year, the next time in their pasture, put that in a slightly different area so that they'll um, be encouraged to, to distribute themselves in an area that often they might typically be avoiding. Um, again, just with fire, the whole point is that when it greens back up here, Suddenly you have a dramatically increased, increased crude protein on the left side in the burn and the right hand side is not nearly as high in protein and uh, more unpalatable for livestock with uh, decadent matter that has not been consumed by fire in it. So here you can see the, the livestock are kind of utilizing this burned area that's kind of greener on the right hand side than what's on the left. And again, what's driving that? These graphs are showing that um, we have crude protein here in the top in time since fire. And so you can see these in weeks. So like, you know, week 10, week 20 after a fire, you have dramatically increased crude protein at pretty high levels. But then as time increases that crude protein levels go down, vice versa with biomass. So the amount of forage that's on the landscape in a recently burned area, you're not gonna have much to eat, but it's gonna be very high in protein. But then as time progresses, that biomass increases while crude protein decreases. So it's still good forage for the livestock to consume, um, assuming that it's meeting their crude protein. So in this case, the biomass crude protein by 120 days since fire, um, in some areas you might wanna be using supplementation because it suddenly the protein levels are low enough. It's not gonna be enough protein to keep those animals going without supplementation. So with rotational grazing, if you have multiple pastures, you put the cattle into that pasture for a short duration. They graze it, you know, maybe a little bit heavily than if it was continuously stocked, but then you move them to a different pasture and you give that grazed area a long time to recover. Uh, typically in our region, you're looking at, you know, hopefully 30 days of rest before you're going back into that same pasture to graze it again. And again, 30 days is a ballpark, you know, keep monitoring that to see what happens with it. Versus if we have a long grazing period, um, uh, sometimes we don't give, excuse me. Uh, so we have a long grazing period. Sometimes we're at a lower stocking rate. And so often we don't necessarily have to have as short of a grazing recovery. Um, but it's, it's a balance too. So here we can see continuous grazing uh, on the far right, short plant, uh, even shorter roots. And so you're continuously grazing, you're not giving it any rest period, it's really gonna be hard on the roots. And so the whole take half, leave half is from part of this philosophy that when you utilize more than 50% of the plant by weight, and by weight, I mean that basically, you know, you pull that whole grass plant out of the ground and you find that balance point where it will balance perfectly on your hand. And so typically that means is that, you know, that, that tip of the grass growing out of the ground, that's just the tip of the iceberg of what's going on underneath. And so studies have shown that when you graze it to less than 50%, suddenly you're impacting root growth as a result. And so we can graze it all the way up to 50%, no impact. Once we get over 50%, that's when you can see dramatic impacts on root growth, which is also what this image is trying to show.
And so the thing with continuous grazing that can be an issue is we have to think that livestock are making forage decisions at multiple stages on the landscape. And so you have a landscape scale communities, they're going to find that particular patch they want to graze, they find a feeding station within that, and then they find that plant that they selectively start to graze. And so with continuous grazing, basically they come back to that same feeding station, take another bite out of that same plant, out of the same plant part, and that's when suddenly we get utilization that they're utilizing more than 50% of that grass by weight. And so you're going to start seeing some negative impacts on root growth and consequent above ground growth as well. And so that's a bad sign with continuous grazing or even if we're overstocked in rotational grazing, if the plants they're actually eating are looking very short and you can see uh, weeds increasing, that's a sign that you need a, to move them to a different pasture and let that area rest. So again, rotational grazing uh, can be a very effective system that you have your one pasture here that suddenly you put in uh, radial fencing that's going around that pasture. Suddenly you got four different pastures allowing you to graze an area for uh, a couple of days, depending on the size of the pasture and how many, land, how many livestock you have, either leaving them in there for a while or for a short while. And then once they've grazed that, you know, grazed, they've taken half of those plants, basically, you then want to tra let them go into another pasture, graze that, let this other one rest, and then you'll go all the way around the circle here. And then hopefully by the time you're in the fourth pasture, that first pasture is going to be ready for you to graze again and allow everything a good rest period. And so thinking about timing of grazing, it's also important when we use rotational grazing uh, between years of grazing, don't put them in the same pasture at the same time. So one year we can have early season, they go into pasture A, then they go into B, and they go into C, and then we rest pasture D completely. So that's what they call deferred rotational grazing. That sometimes you have that one pasture that's really abused, you can give it a full sabbatical before you're back in there with cows again. So then the next year, walking through this again, I would suggest don't put the cows back in pasture A, put them in B go to C and then go to A. Or in this case, if we want to use deferred grazing, uh, maybe put them in a pasture D first if it's had a good rest and then put them in a different pasture so they're in there at a different time of year than they were the year before. That allows those plants are being grazed. Uh, in some cases, it allows them a period that they can actually set seed and help uh, propagate perennial plants down the line. And so it's a good system to have, but uh, and irrigation obviously helps as well that you can irrigate those pastures that are being rested and they will bounce back a lot quicker. And so I'm, I'm encouraging folks to consider using rotational grazing so they actually allow some of these uh, pastures rest. Different cows are different, but you know, some folks will tell you that if you have happy cows, they have no reason to leave the pasture. So you don't need to be as aggressive with your fencing. Um, so a lot of folks are using electric lines with this uh, poly braid stuff that you can essentially just grab it by the handle here and rotate that to different part of the pasture. Or simply, you know, you've got two pastures here. It's pretty easy. You just open up this um, poly braid and let the livestock go right in. You don't have to build additional infrastructure with gates and stuff like that. So it can be fencing heavy, but if you're keeping your cows happy, sometimes you can get away with using uh, this poly braid fencing that's pretty easy to set up, not a lot of infrastructure time removed, uh, infrastructure time needed to set it up. It's not a lot of cost uh, as if you're trying to put a full barbed wire fence in. Uh, but I think the critical component here is, is consider the time uh, that you're doing to use it. Because if you're doing a more uh, intensive rotational grazing system, that's gonna be a lot more time um, time that you're using to move the cows. In some cases, people are using are moving cows to another pasture, you know, just once a week. In other systems, people are moving their cows twice a day. Um, so consider the impacts that that's going to have on your time. Do you have the staff that you can you can work five days a week moving them twice, but you get two days rest that somebody else is moving the cows for you. Uh, so keep that in consideration. Uh, another exciting thing that's coming into the future here is that we're now putting uh, shock collars on cattle uh, 
and then creating a virtual fence boundary, basically um, online and with cell towers that then we're able to basically tell the cows like you would with your dog, uh, this is the line that you can graze up to. And then they get to that, that end of the pasture and they get a shock on the collar. Um, and so this, this could be huge down the road that, you know, instead of being stressed out with infrastructure to make rotational grazing, we can easily move them um, to another area without having to uh, move a bunch of fencing, just simply uh, change the, sit down your computer and change the boundaries of that pasture and that's gonna help them move. Uh, similarly, I think it's gonna help us graze areas, uh, particularly in wheat fallow areas that we don't have fence infrastructure for cattle any longer in a lot of these ag areas, but still with this, you can easily put them in there and uh, you don't have to worry about setting up the fences. I think it's good, it will be important that we continue to have good boundary fences, um, boundary as in uh, perimeter fences in case something went wrong that you're not having cows that are gonna be hit on a highway or something like that. So finally getting to the end of this, what really the important things to think about when you're grazing anywhere is, um, as you're moving the cows out, look behind you and see what rest period do you think those pastures need? And then looking ahead, is that next pasture you're moving to, did that have enough rest since the last time you locked, since the last time you grazed it? And then again, like I said, look where the stock rate, look where the stock are, that your stock rate might not be appropriate if they're actually not utilizing all the pasture that you're calculating into that calculation with. So uh, thank you for listening through this. I uh, have another poll that should be able to pop open here. And so the poll questions here, again, having people think, you know, can you overgraze, undergraze, and graze correctly the same pasture at the same time? And then my other, Question is just, you know, in the future, what other things uh, that I kind of touched on briefly today would maybe be beneficial for folks if I went into more detail on a particular area? And then hopefully this had some impact that maybe you'll look at how you graze your pastures just a little bit differently. So I have that poll open. Again, on this screen, uh, this, uh, link here. I don't know if you're going to actually be able to click on that. I can put that in the chat. You can either go to this website to take a survey, or you can also scan this QLR code. If you take a picture of that with your phone on the screen, it should take you to a website that there's a very brief survey to evaluate uh, my teaching on this this afternoon, and hopefully going to improve in fu uh, future webinars and maybe in-person events in the future that might happen, hopefully. Okay, and I finally see something. So participant asking, will this presentation be available on a website? And uh, yes, uh, there's the uh, Oregon North Central YouTube channel that this is on. Um, and uh, if you hold on a sec, I'm gonna try to get out of my PowerPoint here. So um, if anyone else has any other questions, feel free to put those into the chat or um, ask now. Right now, I'm just looking up this uh, website address. I can put in the chat um, that this will be accessible at in the future. Um, I appreciate everyone calling in this afternoon and being um, participating in the chat there. And again, but yeah, OSU Extension Service for the North Central Region of Oregon has a YouTube channel that we've been posting some of these recorded meetings on.
Um, Okay, so I was able to put a short link there um, that that will take you to where this video recording will be posted. And then there's another question in the chat. And I plan on posting this recording on YouTube and also um, trying to have some additional slides available with some good additional resources other than me talking that you can look at for uh, advice. So the second web address there is for the survey if you want to take that quickly. So the question is, what is the best way to get native grass stands reestablished in large areas where the annuals have taken over? And so that's the hardest part that I dived into this presentation. Uh, that's very easy to point a finger at somebody and say, oh, you're overgrazing that pasture. The hard part is how do you help those overgrazed areas recover? And so, you know, obviously right off the bat, some people will say, well, you need to give that pasture a long sabbatical that you're going to not graze it for a year. But in this case, if you have annuals that have taken over, you're going to want to do something with those annuals other than just leaving them there as a huge fire hazard potentially on the landscape. Um, and so one area is one thing that you could potentially do is go in there in the dormant season. So in this region, you know, the winter time basically, um, or early winter time before you're getting as concerned with, with calving, go in there in a dormant season, try to graze it at a higher stocking rate to really have them graze the cheek grass. Um, obviously, if you're grazing cheek grass in that time, you're going to have to have a good supplemental supplementation program to ensure that you're not hurting animal performance. So it's not necessarily a cheap thing to do because yeah, they're consuming some forage um, that sometimes is not very palatable to them. So they're not gonna wanna necessarily eat it and it's gonna be expensive with supplementation. So it's not a, you know, that's that's some advice grazing in the dormant season can help, but you know, it's, it's not gonna work for everybody in every situation. And then after heavily grazing it and removing a lot of that uh, annual uh, cover, then you could potentially go in and try to reseed it uh, with a native grass mix. And when I say reseed, I don't mean going in there with a disc. Um, I would mean more like um, some sort of no-till rangeland disc if it's not super rocky to try to get some additional native seeds established. Um, and the other thing with dormant season grazing on cheatgrass is they've shown that that can impact the uh, the seedling emer emergence that when you heavily graze it in the dormant season, the cows are removing a lot of litter off of the ground as well. And so uh, by removing that litter and thatch layer, suddenly those seedling, the cheatgrass seedlings are not as likely to germinate. And so that's, that's a way that you can kind of help, help clean up the seed bank as well when you're decreasing that litter layer. Um, so that's a good question and definitely something that I'm looking into more detail on trying to figure out how best to do that in our, our region when you have areas that you're trying to get natives established back again. So that's my long answer. Does anyone else have any other questions? Looks like that might be it. Um, So again, I greatly appreciate all of you staying on the presentation here. Uh, went over a little bit, so I appreciate that. And uh, if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out. Thank you very much.